Hello and welcome to In Good Company with Impact. My name is Dan Jones and in this series we're talking all things leadership. Today we're going to be discussing how to develop leadership and high performing teams, particularly in a hybrid working world. I'm joined today by David Burrs, a highly creative results oriented IT leader with a unique background in engineering, product development, systems integration, training and coaching. With an impressive employment history, including working for the Walt Disney Company, the Mozilla Corporation, LinkedIn, and now Meta, he is experienced in scaling global teams in support of hypergrowth, technology implementation, and product development, with an emphasis on measuring effectiveness. A high-energy, strategic thinking leader who believes in the value of relationship first. David, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Dan. I'm going to get straight on with our first question, which is a little challenge that we're setting all of our guests, uh, which is to tell us about yourself in 60 seconds. Ah, sure. Okay. Uh, So prior to my current career, I was a first responder EMT. um, And I only mention that because it's a little bit relevant to the way that I uh, approach problems today. Um, And it definitely reflects in how I look at things and how I think about things. Um, But I started out my current career on uh, on a computer help desk. Um, and later as a front-end engineer. Um, And like many careers do, mine meandered and led me down an unintended path where I found myself in technical learning. Um, And that is where I joined Mozilla, LinkedIn, um, the Walt Disney Company, and, uh, uh, well, those three specifically. Um, And after developing technical training for those and after uh, a couple of engineering boot camps, um, I again found myself making another shift um, and uh, joined a team to lead a product and data team. Um, this was more back to my engineering roots. Um, and uh, in, that, in that role, I created uh, employee-facing applications, collected data from a variety of workplace IoT, uh, Internet of Things. Um, it was really fun. It was a really different kind of role for me. Um, but the pandemic changed things, it changed priorities, and really made me think about what I wanted to do next. So almost two years ago, I found the role in which I am in now uh, at Meta, Uh, which was a really good blend of all those things. It was managing uh, systems, specifically learning systems, um, products for learning, um, and uh, and a data team. Um, And so that's where I am today. Well, that's brilliant. That's a a great introduction. Thank you. Um, you I briefly touched on it on the intro there, but uh, you describe yourself as believing in the value of relationship first. Can you tell me why is this and uh, how do you apply this in your own leadership behaviors? Yeah, I believe building good and strong relationships in the workplace improves the quality of your interactions with one another, as well as the ability to collaborate effectively and develop better ideas, right? It also um, greatly can improve the team's morale, which I think is really important. So thinking of some very extreme examples, uh, if you're eating dinner in a restaurant where you're getting good service and the wait staff, I'm sorry, where you're not getting good service rather, uh, and the wait staff may may be a little cold and uh, not as attentive to you, you're less likely to ask questions on the menu. You're unlikely to get the waiter's opinion on a good dish. You probably didn't ask for the specials uh, or you could have saved some money, right? Um, And you just can't wait to get out. So putting that into workplace terms, uh, if you don't have a good relationship with your peers, your coworkers, your cross-functional you know, partners and things like that, you're less likely to ask them questions as well. You're unlikely to collaborate for periods of time, meaning you lose the opportunity for more diverse solutions, uh, bigger ideas, better ideas, more ideas, right? Um, and your morale might be much lower in the workplace in general. Um, thinking of like, I just can't wait to get out of work and go you know, home and watch TV or whatever, right? So with extended relationships around the workplace, you're more likely to feel comfortable about reaching out for information, even a favor. And that goes both ways, right? The reverse is true, meaning that the opportunity to come up with more collaborative, higher quality results is much more likely. So how I apply that as a leader, I emphasize team values that emphasize relationship development, building opportunities to help the team form into performing teams, that is a team that trusts each other. Tactically, you can do this um, in a, cur- in a way that encourages values, right? So you, I'm sorry, you can do this through values is what I'm trying to say. So for instance, you can make humor a value. Um, at um, In my current role, we have a social workplace channel that we use and we, um, we use it for team announcements, but we also use it for bad dad or bad mom jokes. We have uh, females on our team as well. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's great. The team has you know a variety of things that they'll put out there and 
And, uh, you know, some of them are real groaners or can kind of tease each other about it, but it really creates a, a sense of um, lightheartedness, right? And that's actually one of the values of, of, my, um, of my team uh, yeah. is have a little bit of humor, you know? Um, so also, if possible, um, occasional in-person meetings are a very effective tool. I know that um, I work personally um, very remote, um, and most of us, and many of us work in a very hybrid environment, but um, I try to make sure that I can attend things in person when possible um, because, you know, side chats and pre and post conversations are not always about work and they help develop those relationships, which help in, in develop trust, uh, which is really yeah. the, the what you're trying to get to. And, um, and it's, yeah. and it's not like hybrid working is, as is a brand new thing since the pandemic, is it? It's, it's always been there in some way, shape or form. It's just more people now are becoming familiar with it as a result, you know, coming back to work after the pandemic. Um, yeah, and it, and you're absolutely right about that kind of the, there are, there is some sort of social element on in a virtual environment, such as whatever it is that whatever platform you might use in, in your organization, but you still don't necessarily get that the same yeah. connection as you would do uh, in a in a kind of an in person environment, um, but I and I I suppose that that element of being human I wanted to kind of touch on and as I mentioned in the intro your employment history which is pretty impressive more recent of your employees have been LinkedIn and now Meta arguably two of the the biggest networking platforms that have been built around human connection a virtual human connection how do you encourage people to be human at work. Yeah, that's a great question. I know you're not specifically asking me about social media, but I'll start with saying that social media tends to get a bad rap, right, sometimes. Um, but it has a lot of good in that it gives us an opportunity or a platform to share ideas, celebrate our happiness and things that have gone you know, really good, and build relationships, which you know, obviously is a, a theme that I press on. Um, at work, we should do the same. Um, and so we, we, you know, thinking about where we are during the day and who we're with, we spend a large portion of our days with those that, that, those that we work with and in the office, even if it's the virtual office, right? Um, so I try to mix things up. Um, number one, if I'm in person, I try to do one-on-ones uh, at coffee sometimes or go for a walk, um, that kind of thing. I also always virtually or in person kick off small team meetings with a personal and professional check-in. Um, the professional check-in gives people who aren't real comfortable sharing uh, too personally an out if they need it. But if I sense or if I see that people do that too often, um, I'm known to say, hey, how was your ski trip? You know, or, or something that I might know that they've done. That's not probably too personal, but just to get them kind of thinking about things. And, you know, people love to talk about, well, just often people love to talk about the things that they do, right? Mm. Uh, for large team events, I'll usually start off or I'll have somebody um, help with an icebreaker of sorts. And we've been really successful at creating some really fun icebreakers that get people awake, get people alive, get people moving, talking, um, and just sort of break that coldness. Also, um, you know, more to the human element of things, I encourage my teams to celebrate anniversaries, birthdays, et cetera. And I also encourage the managers that report to me to do the same with their teams. I think social events, um, when and if appropriate, are important too. So things like a happy hour, if I'm visiting an office, um, creating those chances for social opportunities is key. And then finally, I'll say, because again, much of us or many of us are dispersed um, and in hybrid environments, one thing that we did learn from the pandemic is that we can actually do some of these things remotely. And so an yeah. example of a really good remote team building activity that I participated in uh, was we hired a professional chef to come in and teach a cooking class. And so prior to that, we sent everybody ingredients. We sent them a really cool apron um, <laughs> with you know, a unique logo on it and that kind of stuff. Um, and then we had everybody put their computers perched high where we can see them cooking. And actually, it turned into a really fun event. Um, and But it's those kinds of things, you know, that create uh, – a moment in time that people can reflect back on and you yeah. know, develop that, that, that personal connection, that human, that connection. shared experience. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, well, yeah, we, we, we at impact try to do similar things and we're always kind of on the lookout. I don't know if we'd be able to get professional chefs in for, for some of our solutions, but also, <laughs> we've certainly like tried to do, you know, we, we are absolutely trying to do the best way of kind of allowing people to kind of feel safe and comfortable as soon as possible particularly when we're bringing groups who don't necessarily work together together so that's, yeah, really, yeah. that's really cool 
And I'll just interject really quickly because people might be thinking that it's hard to get a professional chef, but there are actually companies. <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, one of the, uh, Airbnb actually for a while was hosting events like that. I don't know if they still are, but there are you know groups out there that'll do it for a reasonable price. Um, so I, I think the, it, thinking creatively and looking for those opportunities, even if you're remote, um, I think yeah. there are opportunities out there. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah, there's loads of things you can do, and it's it's. Yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, just finding that best one that works for you and your team is really cool. Um, I'm I'm going to move on to about teams specifically, uh, and which is you've been instrumental in helping teams become high performing. And is there is there a particular example that you can share with us, and what secrets can you maybe share that have led to your success? Yeah, I appreciate this question, and I think that. Um, I feel that the success the success of teams lies within the team members themselves, right? Um, I consider my leadership styles a blend of um, what I would call servant leadership and compassionate leadership. Um, and when working with high potential, high performing teams, um, there are a few things that I think can help facilitate success. So, number one, being really supportive. Um, you know, my role is simply to clear the paths for them, um, create opportunities for them to do their work without resistance. Um, and barriers and things like this. And this can be done, again, as simply as being supportive or a good thought partner and as complex as navigating hurdles or speed bumps that they may have with cross-functional teams. Um, number two, being tuned into people's needs. Everyone is different, and some team members need more interaction. Some need less. Um, so really knowing your team and really knowing what, um, what drives them, what motivates them, um, and really being able to press on that. And last, I think it's really important to celebrate wins and success. And this can be in the form, um, in, a, in a formal form, like a monthly business review or, you know, weekly business review or whatever, quarterly, um, uh, with stakeholders that highlights um, or highlights it in all hands even. Um, but also it can be done through appropriate social media channels. Um, at both the two social media companies that I worked at, we had our own internal tools um, to be able to use and celebrate and highlight things. Um, but whatever communication channels your companies use, I think, uh, are appropriate avenues. I think the one thing that I would caution people in or just to be aware of is that not all people like attention or appreciate celebration in public. So consider the individual that you're celebrating or the, you know, yeah. what you're doing as you craft your message. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I, I suppose we've kind of touched upon this already, but what, what specifically maybe can individuals in a team do to help drive that leadership in a, in an, in their organization and keeping in mind the hybrid environment. Yeah, I think, um, you know, in a high performing and an efficiency focused organization, all individuals should think of themselves as leaders. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important for senior leadership to create an environment or culture that facilitates this idea. So Individuals should embrace the idea that leadership can come from any level, any place in the organization. And if it's done right, it'll help drive the organization's success and they, they should be able to see how they can do that. And that comes from senior leadership. So developing strong influencing skills is really important um, for individuals. One should take one should also help to drive innovation uh, when appropriate by thinking creatively and collaboratively with others. And you know, I was thinking about this the other day, thinking creatively. It uh, doesn't always mean looking for a new or better solution for a problem, mm. but often it's structuring the question, right? It's like um, to ensure that we're solving the right problems, that we're looking at it from the right way. Um, and speaking of collaboration, work on developing strong relationships um, with those that you, um, those, I'm sorry, above you as well as your peers, right? And so um, I realize relationships is probably a common theme in our conversation today, but I just can't say enough about the value of a good relationship in the workplace. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I I want to kind of touch on some of the words we, we've been discussing over this, this past sort of 15 minutes or so. And that's the words learning, global, and technology, which are, which are three words that I would say feature in most of your career roles. How do you think that growing teams in a global sense using technology and, you know, helping learning has changed over the years, would you say? Yeah, another great question. I think, um, yeah, you see it permeate across my resume and across my um, uh, past organizations because I really look for organizations that have global teams. Um, 
and support global teams, right? Because I believe that a global team, number one, encourages a diverse mindset um, and is very solution focused. Um, and also if it's a global product or global whatever service that you're doing, you get that whole voice, right? Um, and so uh, to be successful in growing teams and working across global boundaries, you have to first be really flexible. Um, so for example, I live in California and at a previous company I was with, I had a team that sat in India. Um, and so for that team, we would exchange times that we met, right? Sometimes I'd stay up late and meet with them, and sometimes we'd switch. Um, that way the burden wasn't always on one side. Yeah. Also, I'll say um, something I had nothing to do with, but the results of the pandemic, you know, silver lining here, um, being forced to work remotely for a couple of years meant that the field became level, and everyone had to figure out how to leverage technology. So a lot of companies started to invest in new technologies and technology started to invest in R&D and figure out like where could they make better opportunities, right? And I think in general, um, the awareness to connect uh, remotely has increased, right? So fast forward to today, and I think we've become more tolerant of um, remote workers. Like for instance, a dog barking in the background or a child walking through the video. I think people understand like, you know, we're real people and we live in a real world. Um, but our general increased tolerance means that we've relaxed a little and it allows for each of, um, for ourselves rather, uh, a little more, um, what am I trying to say? A little more uh, flexibility in, in, our, in our thoughts, right? Which means in terms that we're more connected. And I think while teams can come together now, um, there is, I'm sorry, I mean to say, teams can come together in person now. Yeah. Um, there's still value in a hybrid environment. Um, again, being able to work, uh, you know, globally in a hybrid way across global lines um, encourages global teams to be able to have that diversity of thought that I was talking about. And diversity of talent. We can hire people from all over the place, not just people that are in the location that we're in or willing to relocate to the you know, place that we're in, um, but from all over the place. And again, I think that just changes, um, you know, how we're able to work. So I think, you know, hopefully um, companies continue to invest in technology. I think hopefully teams continue to invest in that technology. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Well, and, and, and let's face it, hybrid work and hybrid learning aren't going away anytime soon. What do you see as the future of that world, that kind of world of hybrid learning and work? What do you think we can do to, to leverage this, to maximize the effectiveness of, of leadership development? Yeah, um, great question. So I think, as I mentioned, being flexible, being cognizant of limitations, um, but also creating level opportunities for people to continue to meet, right? I think that's going to be uh, something that helps uh, teams work better and be more successful. Um, someone may have dialed in um, while the rest of the team is in the same room. And so when this happens, it's really imperative to create equality in that meeting. So making sure that virtual whiteboards, checking in often with the road attendees to get their perspective, um, all of these things as leaders that we do to encourage um, connectivity and encourage participation um, from the whole team. And as I just said before, I think companies need to continue to invest in technology that supports hybrid working. So it's not just video conferencing, right? But social applications, tools for collaboration, um, things like that. Sure. And we've we've kind of said this already, really, but um, people development is, let's face it, all about learning experiences. And as someone who's helped to develop people throughout your career, what would you say has been your most memorable learning experience yourself? Um, yeah, you know, I think my leadership style has emerged over a long period and a long learning um, from the many organizations or the several organizations that I work for anyways. Um, learning that each person, including myself, has a role. Um, I started to talk about this a little bit earlier, but my role um, is not just to be a manager, but to work alongside of my teams, right? Providing the necessary support and keeping a clear path for them as they carry the ball to the end zone, to use a sports metaphor. Um, <laughs> Also, building you know, true relationships has meant that I'm connected with people from all of the companies that I've worked with. Um, and I love this, right? I still have dinner um, or you know, go to events with people, regularly chat with folks um, that I've managed in the past or worked with in the past. Um, and this is evidence of authentic relationships that have been developed. And I've learned that um, those mean so much to me that I invest in those um, in my current roles. Um, and so I think that... Um, 
yeah, I think that's made me a happier person and give me a breadth of uh, friendships and, and a, a bigger network. Um, the relationship that we keep talking about is not always just in the workplace, but it's it's that network outside and, and being able to uh, connect with other people, I think, helps any leader um, solve problems in a more diverse way, get more heads together. The bigger your network is and the better your network is, the better quality your network is, um, I think the better decisions you're going to make. I couldn't agree more. Um, well, we've reached our final question, um, you may be pleased to know, which is, uh, the, and we're, gonna, we're, we're asking this question to, to kind of everybody that's, one of, that's uh, joining us on, on this podcast, which is, if you are starting over, starting again, what would be the best piece of advice you'd give yourself? <clears throat> um, you know, I think I'm a little bit embarrassed to say this, but I'll be, you know, I'm going to have be totally honest here. I think early in my career, I was very ambitious and, um, I thought that, um, I thought that being a strong, you know, individual contributor, or even a manager, when I started in my manager roles meant that I had the answers, right. And that I had to have the answers. Um, and at some point I realized that not only do I know very little, I know very little about a lot of things, right? Um, and a lot of people know a lot more about a lot of things. And so learning to ask questions, right? Just learning to ask the right questions at the right time and not holding back. Uh, I wish I'd started that earlier on in my career. Um, mm. Just really, you know, the importance of um, getting a little help. Um, the more questions you ask and the more you seek to understand, I've learned that the better decisions you'll make. Um, but again, that wasn't always kind of my thing. There's a really good book out there, and I'm going to forget the author, but um, it's called The Perfect Question um, that I read. And I, I just think, um, I think that should be uh, in everybody's toolbox, uh, learning and being able to ask those questions and understanding what that means. Well, that, what a fantastic answer. And I think that's really good advice to be giving to your, your younger self. Um, thank you very much for joining us today, David. I'm going to let you get back to your day. Uh, uh, and I just wanted to say, yeah, thanks again for, for being such a great guest. And I'm sure people will find it really a, a really fascinating and, and entertaining podcast episode to listen to. So thank you very much for joining. Thanks for the invite, Dan. Thanks for having me.